Making music is fundamental to human culture. Dancing, drawing, singing and playing musical instruments are activities from time immemorial. They are ordinary, yet quite extraordinary things to do. From our earliest ancestors to the present day, we've always done them, irrespective of time, place, culture. Hi, I'm David Bell for KiwiConnection.nz and this week I'm talking about the music of the spheres, revelations of unsounded notes and the timbres of silence. The Bible has some interesting things to say about music. In Genesis 4.21, Jubal is identified as the father of all those who play upon the lyre but a uh, century upon century later, by the time of Amos, there's a stern warning against the rich people of Judah who invent new instruments of music. Judah was wasting money on luxuries while their relatives in the northern kingdom of Israel faced conquest by war, where there was cruelty and starvation. In general, though, the Hebrew people enjoyed making music. They played the horn, cymbals, the old trumpets, drums, and the forerunner of what we call the zither. And of course there was singing, from pastoral shepherd songs to fiery war songs like the sword song of Ezekiel 21, 8-17. This carried into the New Testament times. One of the most moving verses in the Gospels is at Mark fourteen twenty six. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Even unto the trail and death, the power of music in the form of a hymn animates the human soul. Just uh, briefly going back to the time of Amos, very approximately around 750 BC, not only were new instruments being invented, but a new concept of music was starting to stir. The invention of a written grammatical language, that's the early form of Hebrew, had stimulated all kinds of other ideas, including ways to convey musical notes. I personally think what happened next was a miracle of human imagination. It was the legendary Pythagoras in the 6th century BCE who linked up astronomy and mathematics to music. In his universe, absolutely everything was connected by geometry, by numbers, and by ratios. Imagine a string vibrating as on a big double bass. It would sound a deep note. Now, holding the string down exactly halfway along and uh, gently plucking, would generate a new note, and the new note is exactly an octave above, a special sound, a unique sound, but intimately connected to the first. They're a unity. Pythagoras discovered all sorts of relations between sounds and where you divide the string. All the notes of the scale were held together by numbers. Now, while this is true, it isn't the miracle that I was thinking about. Instead, this idea must have come in a flash to Pythagoras. It might have been a revelation from God. Pythagoras said that each of the planets in the night sky must be playing a very special music. He associated this music with the number ratios, their specific individual geometries, as the planets rolled around their orbits. Here was a music that could not be heard, could not be comprehended by human ears. It was the music of God and for God. Pythagoras gave it a special name, which has survived 2,600 years. Pythagoras called this unsounded, unheard music, the music of the spheres. Yes, I think this was a revelation. I think of various composers and musicians who seem to prove it so in other ways. There was Beethoven, for example, 
his hearing had deteriorated so much by the completion of the famous Fifth Symphony, it was almost impossible for him to hear what the music sounded like. By the Ninth Symphony, he lived in a silent world, and yet ringing clear and true and strong are the irrepressible voices singing out the revelation of the Ode to Joy. The sublime mastery of Beethoven's last quartets are equally a testimony to a music that has come from beyond this world and its world of hearing. Beethoven called it the dance of God in his head, but every note was worked and reworked until it conveyed absolute inevitability. Mozart often felt that he had never composed, but rather that the music was simply given to him in an instant. Haydn, whose musical genius was widely appreciated in the 18th century, was asked how he had achieved such a prodigious output. He said, well, you see, I get up early, and as soon as I've dressed, I go down on my knees, and I pray God and the Blessed Virgin that I may have another successful day. The contemporary English composer John Taverner's music is often the result of extraordinary visions and meditations on Mary, Mother of God. And the great Estonian composer Arvo Pet likewise uses chants from ancient Greek Orthodox liturgies to create intense soundscapes, minimalist soundscapes. Igor Stravinsky also firmly believed in the power of prayer. He saw himself as a channel for God to work through. It's powerful, the rite of spring is generally regarded as marking the transition from 19th to 20th century music. He wrote, quote, I had only my ear to help me. I heard and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the sacred has passed, unquote. Of course, many more composers could be added to this list of believers, but that's not the point. Rather, they're all of a mind to say that the music was not of their own making. It was gifted to them. But in that instant of gifting, if we could but be onlookers, we would hear nothing. We would hear nothing but the silence of the music of the spheres. Yet that silence would convey everything. In an instant, everything came that the composers needed. It's like Anton Bruckner's pronouncement on his Eighth Symphony. The last 16 bars are an astonishing culmination, insight that admits no other explanation than what he himself wrote. God revealed it to me. And that's where the matter must lie. No other declarations possible in the silence after the music dies away. The timbres of the silence are as definitive as the music itself. Just so with our own faith. And we're just going to play around now and see whether we can re recreate and rediscover the kinds of uh, experiments that Pythagoras did that gave rise to to Western music. Over to you, Stuart. Sure. Well, if I play this note here, which is C, two octaves below middle C, I can find strings vibrating. Yeah, I'll stop them with my finger. Actually, there are two C strings in there. Let's think of one vibrating and imagine what Pythagoras discovered as the string vibrated from side to side over its length, which is about a metre. About same. the size of a cello. That's right, your cello bottom string. As it vibrated like that, it produced a number of vibrations per second. We call these hertz, or vibrations per second. He then noticed that it not only vibrated across its total length, but immediately it started doing that. It vibrated in halves. Exact halves? Exact halves. And that gave rise to a new musical note. Well, it's a different note, but it's not different enough to have another name. 
If that C, the note that came out of that experiment was the C above, still has the same name, uh, they're not different notes, are they? They are somehow very intimately connected. <laughs> they are, and the connection is this simple ratio of 2 to 1. Uh -huh. uh, there must have been other ratios that he observed. There were. Okay, so there's the first, 2 to 1. He then went, he th noticed the string, as it was vibrating in halves, also vibrated in thirds uh -huh. along those halves. And the note that came out that he had heard from the hammers and the anvil. Uh, that note is what I would call a G. That's right. Yeah. Now, and that's a fifth above the C's. What One, two, five? three, four, five. Five notes, so it's called a fifth. It's, it's vibrating in thirds, but there, it actually gives rise to five steps. That's right. That's right. That's rather interesting. What happens if I there? Well, what would be the next note in that sequence? Right. Go back to the beginning there. Two to one gives the octave. Three to two gives the fifth. Four to two. Oh, that'll give rise to an octave that's because right. that's a halving. That's right. And then five to four gives the third. A third being three steps apart. Da da da. One, two, three. It's a, it's a very interesting note when you sound the third, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the fifth is quite strong. Very strong, yes. The third has some... I can't quite define what it is. How would well, you say? The fifth is, is determined and fixed by acoustics. Right. But you can have many kinds of thirds in there. You can have... And they didn't know this. We know this now. There was a minor third. There was a major third. The Arabs actually had, in the Middle Ages, a neutral third. And which where is, would that sound? In the cracks. Uh -huh. That's very much like jazz performance. Uh -huh. Where you do that kind of thing in jazz. Well, well Greek singing back uh, in, in the time of Pythagoras must have been very rich then because they had all these intervals that we seem to have on the piano. Well, they had them as intervals, not as chords. And that's the big difference. Do you mean by that that, that they were somehow running a melody as if it were a horizontal, but they never, never actually sounded notes that's, together? Well, only accidentally. And later on, when they recognised them accidentally, they called them discords. And they had to be resolved. They weren't proper. So, uh, Greek singing yeah. would have been an octave. Yes. Like, yes. So. And it took some hundreds of years for the influence of that on the early church, for that to be called magadizing, where they recognised that that was the same tune, but sung an octave away. And uh, that name was only recognised in Latin church music. Well, I seem distinct from Jewish music or Byzantine music. Uh, I seem to recall that uh, at, at certain stages in church history, some some music was banned, or, or some intervals were banned from church music. Well, that's another matter. We have been talking about the influence of Pythagoras' scale on singing melodies. It wasn't until the Latin church had recognised Magadizing. Magadizing. Singing, singing in unison. Right. I mean, they've done it, but they recognized They form, it, formally understood what they had written. And they justified it as being very, very good because it was based on the mathematical relationship of two to one. Ah, and that there is a perfection in this relationship. In the and it, it reflects the perfection of God. God. Okay. Now, it's interesting that the next interval to be added to that was the fifth. Yes. And, uh, for example, in singing Amen, if I go Amen, which is a kind of way of singing that that was quite well known. It was a nice way of bringing things to a close, wasn't it? Right, yes. But you could get this, and I'll, I'll have to play the other part. Yes. Amen. Now that's not strong.
strictly in tune because the piano is differently tuned from natural temperament. That's another whole matter, but it's pretty close, and you got the idea of it. Now, the fifth interval came from the third division of the string, right? And I imagine that was acceptable at first because three was the number of the Trinity. Oh, okay. You have to uh, understand uh, these the, things. The symbolism is always there. Always, always there. there. Right. Now, you said there were some, and you rightly said, there were some intervals that were considered inappropriate. And you've guessed it, it's the next in the series. It goes from, say, is the third. third. And this is the chord that, uh, this is the interval that was banned by the church. That's right. That's right. So uh, all the music that we sing in church today is, is based on triads like that, or the minor. Yeah, right. yeah. uh, but for a long time, this this was simply not allowed to be sung. That's right. And and the reason was why. Well, one pope is recorded to have said that the addition of the third gave a sensual, not sensuous, but a sensual quality to the sound. So it was sexy, ah. promiscuous. And very, so, very so most of our churches today, when they sing their Victorian hymns, are actually being extremely sexy yeah, in, right. in terms of how a medieval right. pope would have yeah. seen church music. Had you not noticed this? Uh, 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 with all due respect, no. 